And uh, Meredith uh, originally is from Ontario, and she did her undergraduate degree at uh, Mount Allison, where she did a thesis work on. See. Actually, I didn't do my thesis there. <laughs> so, so her thesis work involves uh, seaweed work in my lab, and uh, we have some other guests. Herb Vanderbilt, who's the external examiner, and uh, so. The plan for today is um, Meredith is going to present her presentation for roughly 30 minutes. And after that 30 minutes, we're going to have um, roughly 10 minutes of questions from non-faculty members of the audience. And then we'll, we're going to adjourn and the examination committee is going to move to another room to finish the, the defense. So with that, uh, Meredith, your turn. So welcome everyone, uh, thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm Meredith, and today I'm going to talk to you about one of my favorite things, which is seaweed. And I'm going to tell you about how harvesting a specific seaweed in Nova Scotia is affecting other seaweeds. So the seaweed that I looked at is Ascophyllum, Ascophyllum nodosum, or rockweed. And as you can see here, it forms really dense, prolific canopies on rocky shores. So this species is a very ecologically important and it can actually be called a foundation species because it modifies the habitat for all other species in the community. By community in biology, I mean a group of interacting species. So all the species in the shore are being affected by this um, seaweed because it's creating complex habitat along the rocks. So the seaweed attaches to the rock via a discoid holdfast um, so basically there's a sticky disc where a bunch of fronds are originating from and one clump of ascophyllum can have many, many um, fronds and that's what creates this really, really um, dense canopy. The other important feature of the seaweed is that it has little air bubbles or air bladders um, which allow the seaweed to float um, when the water comes in and that creates a complex underwater forest. So you can think of the seaweed kind of as the trees in a forest. It's creating the habitat, things are eating it, things are seeking shelter um, from predators in this species, and it's providing a lot of ecological services. So at a high tide when the water is in, it creates this underwater forest, but at low tide it's also equally important because it's protecting all the little critters inside it from desiccation stress. So when the tide goes out, all of these organisms that are normally underwater are all of a sudden drying out. And this canopy is really good at retaining moisture and also protecting um, seaweed species and invertebrates from too much sun. So now what's happening, or not now, it's been since 1959, um, there's commercial harvest of this seaweed in Nova Scotia. And more recently, there's also harvest of this seaweed in New Brunswick. And industry says that this harvest practice is sustainable because biomass that is removed from the system every year grows back on an annual basis. But that's a single species focused approach. So they're only looking at how this harvest is affecting ascophyllum. But they're not asking, okay, but what about all those other species that we just talked about that are affected by the canopy? They haven't asked that question. Um, so I wanted to basically understand, okay, we're taking away this one species what's happening to all the other species that are relying on the canopy. So to give you a bit of background first about harvest in the Maritimes, it is regulated at a federal level, but also at a provincial level. Um, so these are the six regions um, within Canada that um, have been designated to manage ascophyllum. It's also harvested in Maine in the United States. Um, so you can see um, the darker area is where there is A, the most amount of biomass in asco of ascophyllum, but also the most intense harvesting. So I looked at sites within this area. Just to give you an idea of how this is actually occurring, it's pretty simple. So people are going out in just small boats like this and raking the seaweed. So this rake is a cutter rake that's well, I shouldn't say simple, it was designed specifically for this purpose. And it has a blade 
within the rake. So when people rake the seaweed, uh, when the seaweed is pretty close to the surface of the water, so it's underwater, but it's, uh, they do this on the rising and falling tide so they can reach the seaweed easily, they will rake it into the boats. And the important thing to note is that all of these rakes have a guide which basically protects the seaweed because it mandates a cutting height that is set by um, the province. So the cutting height is five inches, about 12.7 centimeters. So what happens is the fronds are cut at this height above the rock, so the hold fast remains intact. And that's what allows the seaweed to regenerate every year because it has a really cool property that allows um, any existing hold fast to regenerate vegetatively new fronds. So that's why this kind of harvest can occur. So the structure of my thesis. Um, I was actually really fortunate and was able to look at three different things. So today I'm going to talk a lot about part one, a little bit about part two, and then only really be able, because of time, to touch on part three. But I can answer questions, obviously, about any of them. So the first part was a big, broad community analysis where I visited 17 sites in southwestern Nova Scotia and asked the question, is community structure of species differing at harvested sites from non-harvested sites? Uh, the second question I asked in part two was, how is a specific species, so a red algal parasite, being affected by harvesting basculum? And then the third uh, section is a little bit um, sort of more abstract, or not abstract, but a more indirect effect of harvest. And I asked the question of how um, does harvest remove p potential biomass that would be entering the system via shedding on receptacles of Ascophyllum. So, part one. So this is a big map of Nova Scotia, just to show you, as you saw in the regions um, where Ascophyllum is managed, I'm looking down here. So if we zoom in, we can see that's that part of Nova Scotia zoomed in. We see um, my design of where the harvest sites are. So something that you will notice right off the bat is there's more orange dots than blue dots. Uh, that was a big challenge that I faced, and it's something that any researcher trying to understand impacts of harvest of Ascophyllum faces, because everywhere you go in <laughs> southwestern Nova Scotia, rock weed is harvested. So it was really challenging to find non-harvest sites, um, and they're all pretty much located in one central area. And unfortunately, that was sort of the challenge that I had, that I, you'll see what I did to kind of mediate that, but that was something that I couldn't really change. Um, so yeah, there are 17 sites. Um, the six Harvard sites are located up near Digby Neck, and then there was an abundance of, um, non, of harvested sites. So, uh, my methods. So this is an example of one of the sites that I visited. So I'm always doing my research um, when the tide is out, obviously, because I'm walking around on the shore. And so what I would do is I would lay down a transect about two-thirds of the way down the Ascophyllum zone. So the Ascophyllum seaweed takes pretty much um, the whole mid-intertidal zone. And so when I'm on the shore and I enter that zone, I walked about two-thirds of the way down and laid down this transect. This transect was 30 meters long, and I sampled it 15 times every two meters. So I wanted to look at above the canopy as well as below the canopy because there are obviously seaweed species in the canopy, primarily Ascophyllum, some epiphytes that grow on Ascophyllum, but also fucus species that compete for canopy space. But then obviously also there's a lot of species relying on the canopy <coughs> underneath um, the, the canopy on the rocky substratum. So I wanted to make sure I got both levels of that. So what I would do is I would place a canopy, and you can see it better in this picture, but there are internal grid lines within those quadrats that allow me to more accurately estimate percent cover of each species. So I would estimate how much each species was taking, how much area each species was taking up of each quadrat. I did this for all seaweed species. And then I was also interested in the primary macro herbivore of the system, which are periwinkle snails. There are two species, um, Lecherina obtusata and Lecherina lecheria. Um, for the most part, there's a couple um, other species, but those are the ones I found the most. So I counted all of these snails, as well as photographed them for future um, image analysis to get accurate estimates of percent cover for them. 
I didn't get any significant results, so I won't really talk more about them now. I'll focus mostly on seaweed species, but I did initially um, include them in my analyses. So after estimating percent cover of the canopy seaweed species and the, subst the substrate species, I then quantified um, my environmental variables. So when I talked earlier about the fact that I was presented with this problem that everywhere is harvested, so I wasn't even sure at the beginning if I was going to actually <coughs> successfully obtain any non-harvest sites, so I thought, okay, I need to be able to have some kind of a question. So I realized that when I go to these harvest sites, it seems that some sites are way more harvested than others. So these are harvest cut marks. Um, some of them, like, for example, you can see a really straight edge of some of those. <coughs> so the fronds that have a very distinct um, straight edge and are clearly cut from a cutter rake can, are, can be counted as evidence um, as harvest. So what I did was I selected 20 holdbacks along my transect, gathered them very carefully. They were all within 1.5 to 2 <coughs> inches diameter and I counted all the obvious cut marks under 15 centimeters. Averaged them across the whole fast, and this was my index of harvest intensity for each site. So logically, the sites that are more harvested are gonna have more cut marks in those 20 whole fasts that I sample. And this allowed me at least <coughs> to ask, okay, even if I can't have a great comparison between non-harvest and harvest sites, at least I can compare within harvested sites how is harvest impacting these species? The other environmental variables, um, so I calculated a wave exposure index. This was not done from in situ measurements, but m was used, um, it's a cartographic measure um, that basically factors in the amount of fetch around a shore location. And then canopy length and canopy depth were measured really simply. Um, at the field site, so canopy length refers to the height um, when the canopy is underwater, so basically frond length, so within every quadrat, one random hold fast was selected and the longest, frank, longest frond length was measured, um, and then average for canopy length at that site, and then canopy depth at low tide was simply taking a ruler and inserting it into the canopy before it had been disturbed to see how thick that layer of frond is um, because that's what's protecting all those um, seaweed species underneath it. So my results. So <coughs> I obviously can't talk about everything I found, but I, I'm talking about what I think is interesting. Um, so there was a significant difference between community structure, so the way species are organized together at harvested sites compared to non-harvested sites. Interestingly, overall, species richness, which is the number of species, was not affected. So that didn't stati statistically differ between harvested and non-harvested sites. So that right off the bat tells us that it's probably something to do with species abundances that is making a difference in community structure. So same number of species are present, but they're there in different quantities, if that makes sense. The other really interesting thing I was able to do was I was actually able to pick out the species, the top six species, and that were contributing most to the average dissimilarity between harvested and non-harvested sites. And what was really exciting for me was that all six of these species have been picked out in the literature in previous studies as being really sensitive to removal of canopy. So it totally makes sense that these species are the ones that are contributing to these differences between harvested and non-harvested sites. So to give you some now some visual Representation, this is an ordination. It's very complicated. You can ask me a question if you want, but I won't explain it now. <laughs> Essentially what it does is it takes all of these sites that have multiple variables, so multiple species in the community with multiple observations of all these communities and summarizes all this data in two dimensions showing how similar sites are to one another. So these red inverted triangles are my harvest sites and the blue upright triangles are my non-harvest sites. So as you can see, there seems to be some degree of separation between red sites and blue sites. That's exciting because it means that there is a difference between harvest and non-harvest communities. After that, I was able to do an actual test that had a statistical um, significance test associated with it. And what it told me was that 
when you mix up a bunch of quadrats and you remove their labels, what ends up happening is when you're trying to differentiate them and all the labels are gone, you can actually use harvest or not harvest, whether it's harvested or not harvested, to significantly differentiate between these quadrats. And you can also use the factor of site to significantly differentiate these quadrats, but they vary a lot more based on what site they're from, whether or not they're harvested. So that makes sense because um, I sampled 17 sites over a big geographic area. So obviously they're going to be affected by all the environmental variables that are differing at all those sites that I didn't necessarily measure. But what is exciting is that there's also a difference that's coming up in signal in my data that um, has to do with whether it's harvested or not harvested. The other cool thing is that when I looked at the specific environmental variables that I did measure, so to remind you that was harvest intensity, can it be length, can it be depth, as well as uh, wave exposure, sorry, <laughs> forgot that for a second. <laughs> um, this analysis um, that will match up all com possible combinations of environmental variables and relate it to back to the biological data actually selected just singly harvest intensity on its own as the best explanatory variable for queen structure. The correlation wasn't significant, but it's still interesting that out of the variables that I measure, it was the best um, variable to explain the variation that I observed. Simper analysis. So this is the what I talked about when I was able to pick out specific species. Um, so the species that it, um, my analyses picked out contributed to 72% of all dissimilarity observed between harvest and non harvest sites. So these species are really the main species contributing to difference. So the first one is a really pretty one. It's pink. Um, it's technically a red calcified algae. So this is actually algae, and it grows on the rock. And I was really expecting to see this as one of the species that was affected because this is a calcified species, so it's very prone and sensitive to too much light. It will bleach if it um, has too much sun exposure. It's often found subtidally, and in the mid-intertidal, it's almost always found under a fucoid canopy, so under that seaweed canopy that will protect it from drying out at low tide and also protect it from too much sun. So in other studies that have done experimental harvesting, so cutting um, and not so I looked at commercial harvest. I didn't harvest anything. This was commercial industry harvesting, but other studies have done experimental harvest, um, and they found that cutting ascophyllum at 36 centimeters and at 18 centimeters, so that's even higher than what it's harvested at in Nova Scotia, so this is more intense harvest, and they found that this species was reduced in cover at their experimentally harvested sites. So I expected to see that at non-harvested sites, this species would be more abundant or have more percent cover in the quadrats and it would be reduced at harvested sites because of the fact that it is so sensitive to gaps in the canopy that are created from harvest because that allows more sunlight in at um, low tide. The next species is another red crust, but it's not calcified. And this is an interesting example. So harvest um, cover didn't vary a lot, as you can see, only 0.2% but it still contributed 16% to the differences in average dissimilarity, which means that this was very consistent. So even though it's not a big difference, it was very consistent between all the sites. So it was almost always just a little bit more at non-harvested sites, oh, sorry, at harvested sites. So this is an example of a species that actually seems to benefit from harvest. And this is also backed up in the literature because other experimental, that same experimental harvest study found that this species actually prefers a little bit more light than is naturally let in from um, an ascophyllum canopy. So harvesting is actually benefiting this species because it allows a little bit more light, which this species prefers. Another species that benefits from harvest is ascophyllum's main competitor for canopy space, which is Fucus fasciculosus. So, <coughs> excuse me, um, harvest um, cover of this species was higher than non-harvest cover. And this is actually a pattern that has been noticed in southwestern, 
southwestern Nova Scotia for decades. So they've been reporting that Ascophyllum cover has been decreasing and cover of this species has been increasing. And researchers have cited climate change as the most likely reason, but considering that this is the region that is most heavily harvested and that it's scientifically it's known, not even harvesting, but if you remove the entire canopy of Ascophyllum, Fucus are better at recruiting to new available bare rock. So we know that removing Ascophyllum is going to increase the amount of this species. Um, so again, I was expecting to see that there would be more Fucus at harvested sites. The next species is David's spe favorite species in the whole world. <laughs> it's Vertebrata linosa. It's a red epiphyte that actually grows right on Ascophyllum, so it relies on it directly for habitat. So obviously, um, he has showed in past publications that this species is definitely significantly reduced at harvest sites. My results um, supported that, so there is a significant difference and reduction at harvested sites compared to non-harvested sites. And also, really interestingly, it was correlated with harvest intensity. So as a site was more heavily harvested, the abundance decreased. So there was actually a, a response from this species to that harvest gradient that I was interested in. Um, and this species, it's pretty obvious, it's going to be um, losing potential habitat when Ascophyllum is harvested, but it also suffers from bycatch. So lots of these fronds are harvested with the vertebrata right on it. And then this result was the most striking result for me. This is a green <coughs> alga. It's an understory alga. Um, it's called Chodophora rupestris, and um, it's actually an important um, canopy forming species on the, within the canopy, so a lot of little invertebrates live within these branches. So it's an important species. And at the 11 harvested sites in all 15 quadrants, I didn't find it at one harvested site, which is really odd. And I found it at four of the six non harvested sites. So right off the bat, that sort of made me wonder wow, like this, this doesn't seem like a sample size thing, like that is a real effect. And when I looked in the literature, this is another species that really requires fucoid canopy to shade it. It's very sensitive to too much sunlight um, and desiccation stress. So this is interesting because not only is harvest removing the upper canopy, but it's also potentially removing this understory canopy. So now you've got two levels of foundation species being removed. The last species that came up as an important contributor to dissimilarity is Irish moss, or Chondrus crispus. Uh, it's another species, as you can see, probably, in the, it's very sensitive to bleaching, so this yellow is not its natural color. Its natural color is that beautiful red, and it is often found in the low intertidal, um, but it will creep up to the mid-intertidal where Ascophyllum is if there's a good canopy to protect it. So it makes sense again that there is less of it at harvested sites because of that reduction in canopy and reduction in protection from sunlight at low tide. So the next thing that I asked was, okay, if these species are being affected, what about a species that I can't actually see when I do my, my visit to the field? So this is a parasite. It's called Coriacolex polysophoniae and it grows on vertebrata. So David's favorite species is this one. This is the branch. And then this is the little parasite that parasitizes it. So what you have here is you have a parasite growing on an epiphyte, which grows on Ascophyllum. So multiple <laughs> layers here. And we already know that this species is affected. So obviously you would hypothesize, okay, this species is probably affected. So what I did was I, again, visited the same sites collected 50 of these little clumps of vertebrata, laid them all out, and scanned them for the presence of this guy. And what I found was that, like I expected, there was significantly higher parasite occurrence at non-harvested sites. So it was reduced at harvested sites. It was also, very interestingly, again, correlated with harvest intensity. So if we look 
as rockweed harvest intensity increases, so as those amount of cut marks increase within the hole fast, parasite occurrence decreases. And that relationship was statistically significant. So something that David and I talked about, which I think we both think is pretty interesting, is all of a sudden this potential idea of a bioindicator species. Both of these species are statistically significant, um, significantly correlated with increasing harvest intensity. So if you wanted to ask the question, how heavily is this site being harvested? Obviously you could use a metric to measure the amount of cut marks or some other kind of refined metric, but you could also look at the species because both of these species seem to be decreasing along a gradient of increasing harvest intensity. So the big picture that for this part of the thesis that I want to leave you with is that harvested ascophyllum is not just affecting ascophyllum, it's affecting all the species. I looked at pretty much just seaweed species, but there are at least three species that I've identified that are significantly being reduced in their abundance. So some future directions of research. I think there are two logical next steps. There's a million things I'd like to explore, but two logical next steps, like basically right after this, what I would do. Um, I would have liked to, in this thesis, include invertebrates um, in my analyses. So I did include those periwinkles, but I didn't um, include the limpets, the dog whelks, the, there were lots of green crabs, just because of time. Um, I did note absence and presence of them, so that fact that species richness was not um, affected, that included um, invertebrate species as well. But I wasn't able to quantify all those species, and I think that would be interesting because all of a sudden you're able to bring in like predators, such as green crabs and dog whelks, and understand how harvest is affecting them. And then the other thing that would be really important is to do a better job of controlling for all the environmental variables um, that are fluctuating at these sites that I didn't measure, so I wasn't really able to control for, um, because we, I saw that site really affected community structure, more so than harvest, so if I was able to statistically control for all those factors, or more of those factors, I could better isolate for the actual effects of harvest, or if I was ever able to find a better subset or closer together of harvested and non-harvested sites where presumably those geographic variables are gonna vary less, I could better untangle those um, effects of harvest. So the last thing that I'm gonna touch on and just sort of show you what I did was this sort of third part that's a little bit different um, and it is shedding. So as you can see here, this is a picture of the surface of ascophyllum, and something seems to be like peeling off. Um, so that is actually cell wall material. We call it epidermis, so epidermis shedding, but it's not really a, an epidermal layer because it's just cell wall that's peeling back. So what this seaweed does, and it's not the only seaweed to do this, is it will have a, a cleaning system. So Ascophyllum is constantly being biofouled, so little tiny critters, little epiphytes, little bacteria are colonizing its surface all the time. And this messes up with physiological processes. Um, so what it will do is its outermost layer of cells will thicken their cell walls, and then it will separate and peel back. And so they'll have a clean layer of cell walls, um, and, and that peeling will remove hopefully all those little spores and diatoms and such. And so what um, I looked at was, we've already, or David has already quantified in his lab, have already quantified the shedding, as well as Moira, have quantified the shedding on vegetative axes of ascophyllum. So if we look at this picture, we know that shedding is occurring on the vegetative axes. We know how much is occurring, but we don't know, no one's talked about what are the, all these receptacles? So the receptacles house the sper spermatia and nugonia, so the gametes of this seaweed. And at certain points in the year, the biomass housed in the receptacles is pretty much equivalent to the vegetative axes. So if shedding is occurring on the receptacles, it can be really important and be contributing a lot of detritus just as much as the vegetative portion is at certain parts of the year. So it's important to quantify. 
So what I did was I quantified it, I observed it, and I found that sure enough, receptacles also shed for their full annual cycle. So they are first start to grow in about June, and then they develop all the way till the next May, and then they release their gametes. So that whole time, they're shedding and releasing that peeling sort of the skin into the detrital community. And then the other thing is that the fouling cycle, so I tracked fouling on these seaweeds, and I found that increases and decreases of fouling, which can then be interpreted as increases and decreases of shedding, are synchronized or in synchrony between the vegetative portions of the seaweed and the reproductive portions of the seaweed, so they seem to be responding to the same internal cue or external cue to shed. Um, I also did a lot of math to quantify um, the amount of biomass that is being released. Um, so I basically estimated the surface area of 12 fronds in December. And what this told me is that receptacles in December, so they're still not fully mature, so in May they will be larger and be contributing more, but just in December, they are, con they are contributing 80% of the mass that the vegetative axes are contributing to. So they're important to consider because every time a frond or a plant or a clump of ascophyllum sheds its entire epidermis, it releases 1.8% of its biomass, of its equivalent mass, into the detrital pool where barnacles, mussels, other filter feeders can eat that material. So what the next step for this is, is what we're trying to do is understand, okay, so when you harvest fronds, you're removing the biomass, obviously, of the frond, but you're also removing the potential biomass that would have been shed for all of those shed cycles that now never happen because you've removed that biomass. So the next step is to try and understand how often shedding exactly occurs and how much material is never reaching the community because you harvested it. So that's sort of a separate thing that I did in my thesis, but it's still related because I was still looking at how harvest was reducing this shed mass. Um, yeah, that's my <laughs> thing. <laughs> this is my supervisor. <laughs> um, and thank you all so much for coming. Thank you, David, for supporting me so much this year. Um, and thank you for my committee members, Maura and Barry, for Lara, who did some work. Um, two summers ago for that shedding work. Um, my beautiful friends in the bio department, all the support from everyone in this awesome department. Um, of course, funding from my Nova Scotia Graduate Scholarship, as well as David's NSERC Lab funding. And yeah, and thank you first for coming today and listening. Um, this is my <laughs> question. <laughs> this is uh, my seaweed research pal. <laughs> yes, so thank you. Okay, well, we have time for questions from students. Well, um, placing your quadrats during the research, how did you determine what part of the intertidal zone to place them? Right, that's a good question. So, when we go back here. So, what Sid is asking is when I place that transect, I always place it in the same spot in every site to be consistent, but why? did I always place it two-thirds of the way down the ascophyllum zone. So a couple factors. A, um, the further you go down the zone, the more sort of light you're going to see. So it's more interesting down the zone. Um, so I want it to be lower down the zone. Um, but at the same time, there's also the fact that this is an intertidal zone. So if I was to go all the way down at the bottom upper limit, um, the bottom limit of the ascophyllum zone, I would have less time to sample. So I wanted to hit the magic sweet spot where I could get lots of diversity, but still have enough time to sample. Um, it's interesting because I actually think that this has a pretty big effect because it's known um, in research that fucoid canopy is more important the higher you go up the canopy as far as like um, protecting the species underneath it. So the further you go up the 
the shore, obviously those species are exposed for longer, so they are really dependent on the canopy, if that makes sense. But the lower down you go, okay, well they're not, they're exposed for a lot less time. So I think it would be interesting to do this at a couple different intertidal heights and see if, for example, I think possibly the species the highest up the zone are probably going to be most negatively affected by harvest because they're the ones that rely on the canopy the most. But there's also less species up there. So <laughs> it's like a trade-off, but yeah, that's a good question. Eric? Okay, so for invertebrate species, you um, like intentionally included periwinkles. Yes. But, um, so I guess I was kind of asking why you other invertebrate species, and then if you were to um, look at the invertebrate species that you uh, mentioned again in your future direction slide, like what would you expect um, to right. see? Here? Yeah. Right. So I basically the the short answer for why I didn't include them all was because of time, because <laughs> I did every single site, all of these things in one tide, so that's obviously limiting. Um, the reason I included periwinkles was because, um, well, they're herbivores, so they're actually directly eating the seed. Um, but what I, I, there was reason to believe that they would be affected because an Irish study, so Ireland, uh, there's also harvest of the species, um, found that the species Litterina obtusata, which are the ones that you most often find on top of the canopy, the other one are mostly on the actual rock, um, they were significantly affected in two ways. There was less of them, and then they were also smaller, which is, they cited, and which I would also agree with, is the fact that they, they are found within the canopy, so not just on top of the canopy, but within the fronds, um, and so they're obviously exposed at low tide to predation. Um, seabirds, seagulls, particularly here, I would see them all over. Um, so with less canopy um, to protect them, they theoretically would be more sensitive or more vulnerable to all these predators, so um, that might actually cause for most of the large snails to be eaten, essentially. So I was really interested to see if that was happening here. I didn't see that, which I was disappointed, <laughs> um, but that's science. And the other thing is I also only sampled like I only counted the ones that I could see without disturbing the canopy, whereas they were really meticulous and picked out all of them. Um, I didn't have time for that, so it would be interesting to see in future study if you picked out all the Litterina obtusata within the fronds, if, you, if increasing the sample size would get a different result. Um, as far as your question with looking at the other invertebrates, um, I'd have to think about that. I'm not really sure what I would expect for things like crabs. Um, but crabs eat these periwinkles. So um, based on my data, I guess I would have to say that there isn't necessarily going to be an effect in crabs because they are eating periwinkles. But at the same time, crabs are also preyed on by seabirds. And so they seek shelter in Ascophyllum at low tide. Like I would always move the canopy and then like find a green crab. <laughs> so um, they could also be sensitive to reductions in canopy, um, possibly because seabirds eat them at low tide. So yeah, good question. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, at one point you mentioned a species possibly benefiting uh, fucus. I forget. It's yes. Epithet. Yes. Um, as sort of a competitor of yes. this species in your study. Um, is there a, let's say that the fucus species, you know, won out in the competition yeah. uh, in a huge way. Would there be a difference in the species that you'd see sheltering under it? Or yes, it totally. So, cover that they provide? Yeah, so if you look at the picture of the fucus, um, it's a lot thinner and it's also less it has less branching, so it's not as great of a protector, you could say. It doesn't, I don't know the exact stats for it, but Ascophyllum can reduce um, ambient temperatures in the canopy between five and 10 degrees Celsius um, because it just keeps so much moisture in and um, it's just like, it's just like, if you went and visited one of these sites, you'd realize how thick this canopy is. Like, it's just, it's such a good insulator um, 
And yeah, so it really kind of moderates those extremes, whereas this species is blade-like, um, and it's much thinner, so it's really going to not do it, and it also doesn't go nearly as tall, so it's not going to do as good of a job. So I do think that's another, that's a good question, that's another way that like if you're continually sort of decreasing ascophyllum, increasing fucus, you are going to be offering less protection. Um, yeah, thank you, yeah. Okay, right. one more question. Uh, Brett? Um, how do you quantify the shedding? Of the, like, because right. I know that you said that David did it on the um, vegetal axis of it, but how do you like just on Yes, the so um, how we did it, we did it two different ways. So quantifying the shedding um, is essentially what we do is we collect all these little receptacles or portions of frond, um, and then we keep them wet, and then we watch them dry. <laughs> and when we watch them dry, what happens is the wet areas um, and the areas that dry kind of indicate what is heavily fouled and what is lightly fouled because the lightly fouled as areas will dry quicker. So it's sort of a time game and like <laughs> watching them and then taking pictures and then doing surface analyses of the dry areas and the wet areas. And then once that stopped working because receptacles get really round and then it was just the center that was always drawn, <laughs> um, we basically, I just tracked shedding so I would uh, instead of quantifying it, I just said like presence or absence of shedding in a lot of receptacles, receptacles and that was just done by like looking at the lending scope thing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming.